Welcome to the Blooming League of Original Podcast. G'day and welcome to an extra twisty edition of Thrush and Treasure, the torture chamber musical comedy podcast that holds the limbo bar steadily below the knees before tripping each other over with it. And speaking of bar stead, I'm Aaron, and I'm joined as usual by the man who owns 19 pairs of shoes, but only three pairs of socks. It's Spencer, the Broadway spy. How's it going? Doing great, Aaron. Really excited for your interview today. Awesome. Uh, apparently your teachers have ended their strike. Yes, we had uh, two days left of classes before break. So we went in for two days and now now I'm back home in, in sunny and beautiful Chicago. Well, awesome. Right in the middle of winter. Lucky you. Yeah, we have a blizzard coming on Thursday. Oh, do you? Oh, fun. Gonna say, well, I'm going to be dying on this side of the world, so that'll be just as fun. But anyway, so I've got some questions here because obviously you're one of our new co-hosts, our alternating co-hosts. So we're going to do some quick questions for our listeners to get to know you. Each time we have one of our co-hosts come on for their second or third episode, we'll do one of these little questionnaires. So where did you grow up or is that yet to happen? Huh. So I, I grew up on the North Shore of Chicago, a suburb of Chicago. As you would say, I, I'm very young. I'm turning 21 next week. Mm-hmm. And so I have not entirely grown up yet, but I'm getting there. Yep. What would be in your ultimate rock star rider? So I the a different answer to this because I've actually had a rider before. It's Diet Coke yep. and Diet Coke or Diet Pepsi. I, I have no preference. I drink bottled water during a performance, yep. but beforehand, since I do not enjoy alcohol, yep. um, I I will always just have a nice carbonated something yep. and it gets me going. Well, we hope you don't enjoy alcohol since you're not yet old enough to drink. Yeah, that's true. In Australia, you would be because it's 18 here or as the photos of me as a one-year-old will show. Or you could be German and 14. Oh, no, I was much younger than that. There are literal photos of me in a nappy sucking on a beer, a bottle of beer, a VV at that. So what else would be in your ultimate rider? Like, like a choir when you walk in the room or something? A good couch. I've sat in many a green room or a dressing room where the couches suck. Yeah. I want a good, comfortable couch to sit on before a show and after a show. You can take a nap on it. You can do everything with a couch. If I eventually am on a big stage tour, yep. I am bringing a couch with me on the tour. It will be in the truck. Yep. What's your weirdest or nerdiest party trick? This is going to be a real nerd. I can name facts and different shows that were in all 41 Broadway theaters. Yeah. That's my party trick. So what would be your top five movies? Yeah, I mean, in no particular order. Is That Thing You Do, yep. History of the World Part 1, Mel Brooks, Yep. The original Star Wars. Okay, yeah, A New Hope. The original Austin Powers. International Man of Mystery. Yes. Yeah, I love that movie. And then Spaceballs. Oh, I love Pizza the Hut. We used to have in Australia all-you-can-eat Pizza Hut restaurants. That's dangerous. Yeah, you get all-you-could-eat pizza, pasta, salad, and dessert, and there'd just be a pizza bar in the middle, and they'd just dish out the pizzas, and you just go get as much as you wanted. It was great. I miss them. I really do. Anyways, guess what? What? We have another legendary Hollywood diva in the studio today. So burn the land and boil the sea because you can't take the sky from this truly tremendous talent who torpedoed into television by hanging 10 on a high tide. But that was after trickling his toes in the talkies with Platoon and that men's club full of dudes caught the eye of a stranger and helped him catch a killer wave of deadly gigs where he'd done already dug dead corpses whilst digging up business, which no doubt got him used to working with dead things like Reanimator enjoys massacres and matinees. And there, Eliza, Korea, that has piloted this thief of hearts across a new world with strange, sorry, this strange world with new beginnings and sudden endings as the king of cancelled culture, reigning over many shows that lasted longer than any of my past relationships, like Cavell, Wonderfalls, The Chicago Code and Drive, which he created, plus Terrier's standoff and another creation, The Insider, shout out to Adam Baldwin and Dead Things. 
But faster than a speeding bullet, he's saving Lois, Clark and Zorro and making us all a true believer in this prodigal son who's such a cool dude, he brings the big chill, ready for some shock and thaw, with thrilling and chilling episodes of Dollhouse and The X-Files and Angel, two shoutouts to Dead Things and Adam Baldwin, as well as writing, directing and executive producing, ka American Horror Story Feud and Ratchet. Hey, that's my name. Plus, while this Aussie cuckoo is flying over the Ryan Murphy nest, this legendary lad also created 911 and 911 Lone Star, which in Australia is called Triple Zero. So on this bright and cloudless morning, we dispatch a huge Aussie g'day and a yee-haw for the single cowboys, as we welcome to Briarcliff's favourite torture chamber this magnificent man whose melodic monologues and vivacious verbosities helped fuel a firefly into flight. Before that, two met an untimely death and a greedy fourth shout-out to Adam Baldwin. But he is so like yesterday, and today we're joined by a writer, director, producer, and muse who can amuse and send yous to the tissues with just a few scribbled words, and oh my god, he killed Doyle! So before the madness ends and I run out of gas, we're turning the tables on this oh-so-mega alpha artiste, this Hollywood hexploiter, this minor of magic, it's the tremendous Mr. Tim Minear, yay! Welcome to the torture chamber, how are you going? I'm about to pass out. Oh my god, I'm so glad you screwed that up the first time, because I, I, I picked up at least three more references. Goodness gracious, man. Like, really obscure references. Like I, I picked up the title, like the title of a Zorro episode there at the end, turning the tables, which I completely forgot about. Yeah, and uh, and then you had you had dudes in the beginning too, which was a Penelope's first movie that I was a PA on. So that was that was that. That was damned impressed. Thank you very much. And look, you work with some of the best writers. You are one of the best writers in television working for the past 30 years, Tim. Coming from you, that is a, a complete honor. Oh, thank you. It really is. But yes, that's what I did. I picked out all the episodes that you had written, not necessarily just from the shows, but ones that you had written. I always do that with guests. I sort of work their sort of titles, the deep cuts in there and, and all that and find the patterns. That's what I do. It's not just a matter of making jokes. I have to find the patterns and stuff. And I noticed a lot of your work is about a lot of dead things a lot of dead people a lot of dead lot, lot of, a lot of dead people i they used to call me the timinator oh really yeah because and, and in fact there was a t-shirt that called me the tim reaper mm-hmm. and it was it was like all the names of all the characters that i had murdered but most of that was just on angel yeah so yeah you know. so watch your step Aaron. is really all i can say i'll tell you what you have actually led me in the right direction before tim because you might not remember this about 13 years ago and we were chatting on Facebook, probably about, I don't know, classic movie stars or something really nerdy. And I showed you a crossword that I had compiled, which was based on the mutant enemy canon of work. Oh, I remember this. Yeah. yeah and I I just had made it just for the sake of make just to see if I could. I made musical theater crosswords. I didn't make anything else. And you said, you've got to put this online. And I'm like, I don't know. Like I got Tim Minear sitting there saying, you've got to put this online. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. And I thought about it and I did. And three years later, I actually ended up, this is Buffy season eight, the final issue. Oh, wow. I worked with Dark Horse. And as you can see, it's been autographed by Adam Baldwin, friend of the Torture Chamber. He signed it for my birthday one year. So yeah, and I got in Buffy after all that time. I got in Buffy. You are you are now a, a footnote in the legacy. I am. I am cousin. I'm a distant cousin. Yes. That's what I am. But it is thanks to you for urging me to put it online because I, I wasn't going to. It was just, I didn't think it was good enough. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That's super cool. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. So you have been very, very busy lately. You are obviously with the House of Ryan Murphy which keeps you very busy doing two shows at once, sometimes three. Yep. Do you ever find time to sleep? No. No, I didn't think so. Not really. Not really. That's actually why I pushed this for 30 minutes. Yeah. Because the day before yesterday, I really didn't sleep at all because I, I was finishing posting episode four of, of Lone Star for this year. So I didn't sleep and uh, it just kind of caught up with me this morning. So I had to take a 30 minute nap before I signed on to this. I completely understand. Look, I do one show and I barely sleep. Man, it's, it's a podcast. It's not even television. I completely get it. Um, You've got all these, you've got this empire on, on your shoulders, you guys doing all these shows that are massively popular you know especially being anthologies as well but some of them being anthologies i quite like that with anthologies do you find that sort of more something you can sink your teeth into writing because you get sort of the same actors every season some of the same actors coming back but you get to write different characters for them is that a more freeing well what i would say is this is that you know ryan actually changed television with american horror story not just because of the 
the horror of it. But when we did the first season, I was very skeptical about even signing on because I'm like, I don't know how you sustain a horror show over five or however many seasons that they want your TV show to be. Like, yeah. why wouldn't they move out of the, da the damn haunted house? And it was only at the end of the season, like nobody knew that when we came back for season two, it was going to be like, it, we sort of took a page from Orson Welles, right? He had this repertory company, the Mercury Theater, and he would, you know, use the same actors and they'd be playing different things in different projects. So the idea that we'd come back with American Horror Story Asylum and we'd be using some of the same actors, but in an entirely different universe, it allowed us to tell a complete story in one season. And that hadn't, people were not doing that before American Horror Story. It mm -hmm. sort of opened up the the gates to things like, you know, Big Little Lies and every other limited series. I mean, I was making limited series because of my failure. They'd just get canceled. It, it opened the door for this whole new idea of a limited series. So, yes, I think, you know, particularly for something like Feud, which was a story of Joan Crawford and Betty Davis and, you know, in the middle of it, the making of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Yep. What was great about that, that was only eight episodes. You really can't sink your teeth into something like that. On the other hand, the, the open-ended world of something like 911, you can sink your teeth into that because you can explore every corner, do every genre, do every tone, every mood. You can do horror, you can do a thriller, you can do a rom-com, you can do a satire, you can do, you know, something is tasteless like, like a John Waters movie all in the same episode. Yeah. So, well, I'll tell you what you can't do with 911 is eight pastor tim because this is the problem that i've had with american horror story for the past 12 years that every time it's, i've got a new episode to watch i'll sit down with my bowl of pasta for some reason it is always pasta it is never anything else on on whatever night i sit down to watch american horror story and i get halfway through the episode and i'm like or well, halfway through my meal i'm like why am i doing this to myself again yeah and so last night last night i thought innocently oh that's all right it's not american horror story it is 911 i can watch this fine with a bowl of pasta and then a man cooked himself in a tanning bed and like bits of his skin came off and no yeah no that's what you cannot eat pasta yeah i would i wouldn't there, there's a lot of like face maggots and body parts coming off yeah. and people being eviscerated and tapeworms coming out of people's butts uh it's maybe not the best dining companion 911 no but that's the thing i'm single so my dinner dates are me in a tv program because that's all i've got in my life <laughs> but anyways we're gonna move on to the metal album uh, before I embarrass myself any further. So firstly, what would be in your ultimate rock star rider if you were a rock star? Uh, well, you know, uh, a lot of prostitutes probably. No, no. Um, mo mostly I would just want like, you know, cable TV and um, all the room service I could order. I'm a very simple person. I'm very middle class. Yeah. American Horror Story has a lot of dark music in it. Um, Angel had a lot of sort of indie music in it. Have you had much experience with metal or heavy metal, new metal, glam metal, thrash metal, the list goes on? One great thing about Ryan Murphy TV is that um, we have usually a pretty a pretty fat music budget, so we will have mm -hmm. like the best songs on our shows. I was yeah. cutting an episode of, uh, of Lone Star, and the scene wasn't really kind of working. There were a bunch of rattlesnakes in the scene. And for some reason, I'm like... Get Jumpin' Jack Flash by the Rolling Stones and just slap it over that and let's see what happens. And it yeah. worked perfectly. Um, <laughs> but I don't think I've used a lot of metal. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just not, it's, I'm not a connoisseur of it. I, I, yeah. In fact, interestingly enough, one of the movies in your monologue, Dudes, was directed by Penelope Spheris, yep. who directed Decline, The Decline yep. of Western Civilization, which is like the seminal punk rock. She, she broke out with this documentary about mm -hmm. punk rock. Yep. When I was working for her, she was getting ready to do Decline of Western Civilization Part Two, The Metal Years. And I thought I, I thought she was a um a betrayer and a traitor. <laughs> so that that's really my experience with metal is, you know, wagging my finger at Penelope Spheris, which I had no right to do. Yes. But anyway. I agree. We are not worthy. And please come on my show. <laughs> so obviously she directed Wayne's World, like Correct. Of course I'd want and the little rascals movie. Hello. Like I loved that movie as a kid. I can still quote it today. Like that letter that Alfalfa reads to Dala. I know it off my heart. How's I'm nearly 40, Tim. <laughs> Anyways, that was 1990. That was that's a nearly 30 year old movie. Goodness gracious me. Um God, don't we all look old next to Spencer? He's only in <laughs> college. He's only turning 21 next week, apparently. Oh my god, what a child. 
Yep. Anyways, we're going to move on. I'm going to read my review because I picked the album this week and I picked a band called Farmer Boys and I'll explain why in my review. So the album is Till the Cows Come Home. When I first picked Farmer Boys' Till the Cows Come Home, it was purely to match it with Gypsy. So I loaded up the first track, Prized. But will I be surprised or will this compromise my Christianity? As the opening drums and guitar kicked in, it felt a little too familiar. A common sound heard from too many bands. So once the vocals started, I didn't know what to think. They're brooding, almost whiny, with a yearning in them, but not a strength. That, it appears, lies in their lyrics, as they did not take any familiar or whiny turns in their first track. Then track two started, and I held my breath for When Pigs Fly, and this time found a song about love. Ew, gross. But its dark, emo-riddled flavours help this swiney love song bake on the ears without being a bore. That's track four. By the third track, after songs about chicken and pork, I was ready for dinner. Sorry, I was waiting for things to heat up, like dinner. And luckily they started to with Barn Burner, which had a spiralling down vibe without making me dizzy. It's kind of interesting. I mean, it's about a girl who spits in his face, but hey, we all have our vices. Track four was bore, not a bore. Well, I mean, never mind. Lyrically, it starts off with all animals are equal. Clearly, this German band hasn't lifted up an Aussie toilet seat to find a foot-long spider waiting to bite them on the bum. I am not equal to the spawns of Satan. But I digress and look over my shoulder. This song is dark, theatrical, I kind of dig it. Picnic started, and I was reminded of a pig named Rick I recently dealt with, so that's just petty of me. But yet again, we have a dark, kind of fun song. These guys have a bit of spunk, some zany zips and zaps for no reason, and interesting lyrics about animals and food, and I honestly can't complain beyond, well, nothing. Huh. Am I dying? Vocally, the lead farmer boy has improved with each track. It's just a pity that... No, really, I pity nothing. No, really, am I dying? Three and a half stars. I read this was less groovy than past efforts, so I look forward to a second date with the Farmer Boys. Though, honestly, one would suffice. Yeah, I... This was quite interesting. You you, you liked it? I think. <laughs> were they doing an Orwell thing with the um, All Animals Are Equal? Was it Animal Farm? Is that what they were singing about? No, it was very much about, like, there, there was songs about bestiality, slaughterhouses, and life on the farm, and stuff like that. Like, even the, the love song wasn't really a love song. It was, I think that was the one that was about a slaughterhouse. Hmm. So it's like a combination of Orwell and um, E.B. White. There's a little Charlotte's Web in there, and having sex, and having sex with animals. Yeah, it's like, weird sounds great maybe i will take up metal now that you've uh, made it so enticing yeah yeah i think so i just i don't know what i was expecting because i typed in groove metal bands and found a list and i saw farmer boys and it was really just because of gypsy wait how does that match up with how does that match up with gypsy dainty june and her farm boys <laughs> right right got it got it got it <laughs> that's what we do on this show we connect them up so weekly wow right yeah i quite enjoyed it all right i enjoyed the song titles i just i i appreciated all the song titles yeah but i don't know if the song titles really related to what the songs were about oh a hundred percent hundred percent the first song i didn't really like as much as the rest of the album but lyrically it was really really strong i thought nominate the sitting hens while they cling to a screen wire watch them picking with their cutoff bills crown the fattest crown the best breeding brooder that contest what <laughs> like a lot of these albums we've covered have all been like my life sucks and i need a hug and rah 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 <laughs> This is not. Is every song about barnyard life? Pretty much, yeah. So, so they're they're really they're they're picking a lane and they're sticking to it. Well, they did apparently for their first two albums, but there's only like a little bit of information on Wikipedia about them. Their first two albums were pretty farmy. Their third, fourth, and fifth albums, I think they've had five. They were more mainstream, I believe. Now they're German. They're pardon me again. I uh, don't think they've gone anywhere around the world. Hmm. They didn't chart on any other country. I didn't see anything about them touring. They're 
this weird little non-country farm band that does metal and sings about some of the strangest topics that I have ever heard of. You know, the, the music business fascinates me and confuses me now. Because, you know, when I was growing up, you'd have to you either hear it on the radio and then you'd go to like an actual record store and either buy vinyl or CDs. And now it's like everything's streaming. So I don't even know how things can chart anymore. And does anyone actually listen to the radio anymore? Yeah, some people do. Okay. Some people do. I don't know who they are, but I'm sure they're there. For a little bit of context, I, I'm a jazz and contemporary music major. Yeah. Yep. I just, uh, not this past semester, but the semester before it, took a, a music business course. Mm -hmm. My professor was in his early 80s, played bass with Frank Sinatra. Amazing. Oh, wow. And he was teaching us about the music business. Mm -hmm. Now, not the music business today, mm. but the music business when it was a record store and you're listening to the radio. And someone asked on the last day of class, he opened it up for questions. What is the business like today? And he said, I gave up on the business 20 years ago. Wow. Because it got too confusing. It's confusing because everything everything's available at the touch of your you know mouse or your phone or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I'll search on my phone and I feel like I'm, am I even paying for stuff? Because it's like, I'll search anything on my Amazon music and it'll just come right up. So like, how do they make any money? I don't get it. Everything's, everything's pirated. and yeah. Well, that's the thing. Artists, they're not. Artists aren't. I believe it is 0 0.001 cents per stream. Wow. When it comes to Broadway performers, that's been something we've ranted about basically a lot of times because even the Gypsy album that we're doing, the 2009 cast recording, and Alison brought this up when she was on the second time she came on just recently, they're credited as their character names. So who's getting that money? I don't know when it comes to something like that, but here, here I'll, t I'll tell you something. It is not uncommon for like in one episode of 911 or Lone Star for my licensing fee budget to be anywhere from a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars an episode. Oh, yeah. So like I, ju I just licensed for an episode of Lone Star some of the Tangerine Dream that was on the soundtrack for Risky Business, and I think I'm, you know, I'm spending uh, probably close to forty grand just just for that one needle drop. Bloody hell! You know, and so yeah. and, and I and I spent a buttload of money to get Fleetwood Mac into the finale of season two. You know, and you you have to go through all the process. You have to, and and sometimes I'm literally right on the cusp of this thing's going to air in two days, and I d I can't get the rights to the song I want. Yeah. So I know that there's definitely money to be had for licensing. Yeah, a lot more than there is in streaming, I'll tell you that. And, and Glee would have been hella expensive then. Well, what it, the thing about Glee, though, is that it was a cash cow. Yeah, true. <laughs> they'd record those songs and then they'd sell them yeah. and release them. So, yeah, they're paying licensing fees and publishing fees and things like that. Um, but I think that... Um, I think that the music that was generated for the show was a a, a tremendous um, financial success for the company. Yeah, true. How does that factor in? Because obviously you just said 40 grand that you're spending. How does that factor in with DVDs and international streaming? And I ask because there are, there have been certain shows that either haven't made it to DVD because of that reason or like Dawson's Creek's a great example that there's two different theme songs for it depending on where you are in the world. Yeah. And it's because of licensing. I know that um, there was a show in the 80s that was a very uh, formative show for me as a writer, which was called 30 something. It's only on for like three seasons, but it had a tremendous needle drops. It would be Joni Mitchell and it would be just like these great songs. And when they released that show to DVD, they swapped out all of their premium needle drops for kind of generic replacements, which really diminished the enjoyment of, of rewatching those episodes. But I think like the, the fees that I pay for any given episode of 911 or Lone Star, like that's the fee that we paid. And when you watch it on Hulu or Amazon or what, wherever you watch it, um, it, it's the thing that we put in there. So I think it's probably a one-time fee. Maybe there was 30 something that I read about. There was something that was completely changed. Yeah. 30-something. I know, look, there's been numerous things along the way, which is quite annoying. Because then if you want to see things in the original form, you have to rely on people's VHS recordings yep. from the 80s and 90s. That's correct. Yeah, but in terms of this album uh, and these songs, it did sort of... Because this was a 97 album, it very much rang of this was a band that could have played at the bronze, mm. very much so. Just the, the sort of, because there was a bit of funk to them, a bit of spunk in their music. Once you got 
off that first track. Interesting. Yeah, it sort of definitely had that that vibe to it, that emo vibe, goth sort of feel. What do you even categorize as metal? Like, would you categorize Led Zeppelin as metal? Because I do listen to Led Zeppelin. Is that metal? Yeah, heavy metal. To me, it just sounds like blues. Yeah, I can see that. Well, David Yazbek picked them for his album, and I wasn't going to argue with him. I just don't know if it's. I don't know. I don't know if it's heavy metal though. I mean, it it definitely rocks hard. I would definitely categorize Zeppelin as more of a hard rock than a metal they're right on the line i think Mm -hmm. like they could be either rock or metal to me he's 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 just doing you know american blues whereas these guys i didn't hear the groove metal i did hear that there's that spunk there is that flavor there was some twists and turns to the especially the drums which again started off it started off very cliche so i'm glad i continued on and i didn't switch off all right spencer what did you think of till the cows come home i thought this album was really cool I'm not the biggest metalhead in the world and have not been exposed to a lot of it. You know, a lot of it recently has been through this podcast. And I think that that this album was really something different. You know, they come in with that first song, Prized, with that really powerful, bright sound that, that you hear a lot off of these albums. But then, you know, with When Pigs Fly, we have this really different, like, tonality that I really was digging. That was probably my favorite song on the album. Kind of reminded me a little bit of Blink-182, where they have these different vibes okay. in the different sections of the song. thought it was really, really captivating to listen to. And lyrically, this whole album is uh, not really as dark as a lot of these Mills albums that are out there. I did love all of the song titles, because, you know, they're the Farmer Boys, and the album's called Till the Cows Come Home, so a lot of great, you know, stuff about barns and farm animals. Um, then with the third song, Barn Burner, it was very, like, electronica, hip-hop in the beginning, and then, of course, went darker into the metal. But, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this album. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of really interesting lyrical ideas that I'm not used to getting from metal music. I didn't hear that blank influence. Like, a lot of that, like, switching vibes in different parts of the song um, is really what got me that. Yeah, there was a bit of unpredictability in there, wasn't there? Yes. I kind of appreciated that because I hate predictability. Uh, Yeah, no. Um, So what would you give it out of five? Probably a 3.8 out of five. Yeah, it's about that, isn't it? Because there's so much potential. So much potential. Yeah, definitely towards the second half of the album, I felt like it was getting kind of tired. I do reckon I thought, I felt, well, especially the first song, obviously, I've said that 10 times. I sort of thought the opposite. I felt it got stronger as it went along. Might also be that I got more tired as the album went on. Possibly, and I do know that feeling all too well. I run this show. Um, Awesome. Well, then we'll... But it looks like Dainty June is sending her farmer boys to an ad break. (laughs) We'll be back in a moment. G'day listeners, Aaron here. We thought we'd better send a spy to Broadway to check out the shows for us. So here for today's review is our Broadway spy, Spencer. So our next review is for the revival of 1776 at Roundabout's American Airlines Theatre. This revival is an entirely female, non-binary, and trans cast playing all of the founding fathers of America at the Constitutional Conventions in 1776. It is a new production with beautiful, sparse set design, both modern and period-appropriate costuming that I thought really added to it. Their entire bottom layer was modern clothing, and they were wearing a period-appropriate coat over it. Uh, the cast was fantastic. You had Carolee Carmelo as John Dickinson, who stole the show. I mean, Carolee Carmelo is just amazing. And she had that first number, which is Sit Down, John, and just just knocked my socks off. Then you had Elizabeth A. Davis, whose Thomas Jefferson was extremely beautiful. And then at the time, you had Crystal Lucas Perry as John Adams. She has since left the show to be in the new Broadway play Ain't No Mo 
but her performance was masterful. And of course, you've heard the controversy about this show, about Sarah Porkola, but their performance was the best part of the whole show for me. Their molasses to rum was extremely powerful. Now, whether the show is for tourists or purists, it is for neither, because theater purists will not like this show, but tourists will not get this show. So if you are someone who knows the show and would like to see a reimagining of it, then go see 1776 at the American Airlines Theater until January 8th, and then, hopefully, on tour of the U.S. And we're back with Thrush and Treasure. I'm Aaron, that's Spencer, and we're joined by a master of the Murphyverse. It's Mr. Tim Munier. Now, before we get into this week's Chosen Musical, there have been reports about you guys doing a series based on a chorus line. Will this be American Musical Story, Tim? <laughs> Is it true? Well, that's interesting. I know I know there's been talk about it. Ryan has so many plates spinning. Who who knows if that'll turn into a thing? It's quite possible. But I would not probably be involved with that. No. Um when I heard it, I sort of thought about it. I'm like, yeah, that that could kind of work. Maybe it not could. in eight episodes, maybe in a shorter six or a four. I don't know if mm. so it's there's talk, so that's all we've got. We've got no nothing solid that we can no. Nope. Nothing nothing solid. No nope. exclusives for my tiny little show. That's all right. We're gonna move on to Gypsy, which is one of the greatest musicals ever written, and Tim picked it this week. Yeah, so Spencer, you didn't know this at all. Yeah, which which is rare, as we know, for me with musicals. I see a lot of modern shows. You know, I, I live in New York. I, I've seen almost everything so far that's on Broadway this season. But what's interesting about Gypsy is it reminded me of all the things I love about the modern American musical. You know, I love a good overture. Gypsy's Overture is one of my favorite overtures of all time, as is another Jewel Stein show that's on Broadway right now. Oh, Funny Girl, yeah. Funny Girl has an amazing Mm, overture. Amazing. Again, connection to Ryan Murphy as well, with Leah Michelle starring in that right now. Just amazing overture. You know, obviously, I'm a huge Sondheim fan. I just saw Into the Woods on Broadway for the fourth time in a short amount of months if you keep going spencer you're going to get lost in them woods i am anyway so i've been dying to say that to you for weeks you, you you heard it for the first time for this yes now i'm just curious you 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 had to have been like oh i know that song oh i know that song oh i know that song yes you, you, you had to have recognized the songs right i knew everybody's coming up roses and there were a couple others that i was like oh i know this but it, it was really interesting and then Aaron sent me a pro shot, which I watched as well. Yep. Um, I don't know uh, what production that was, though. That's London that... 2015 with the brilliant Imelda Staunton. Yes. Yes. Umbridge. Yes. And now she's, uh, I believe, Queen Elizabeth yes. uh, on the crown, Yep. Um, which was very jarring for a Harry Potter fan to to see that and not be like, oh, she's evil. <laughs> but yeah, it was really interesting um, learning more about this musical Mm -hmm. i enjoyed it a lot great orchestrations i'm a big nerd on that you got a nice big orchestra you got those amazing those beautiful orchestrations and those dance arrangements that i found out that the dance arrangements were by john kander which i thought was kind of interesting i didn't know that I've seen the movies a thousand times and I never knew that in my life. Yeah, it's a great musical. And and it's, it is it is interesting, too, because that along with West Side Story, you know, those two shows where Sondheim just did the lyrics and yes. not the music. It's pretty fascinating. To, to me, it just shows Sondheim's genius, because when you think of everything's coming up roses, like that's a that's a cliche, right? Yeah. He invented that cliche. Like when he was writing the lyrics for that song, he needed to come up with a phrase that sounded like you'd heard it before. You had not heard that before. He came up with everything's coming up roses and he invented a cliche. Like that's the kind of genius that you can only uh, stand in awe of, it seems to me. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of the time, especially recently after his death, we don't talk about his lyrics as much as we should. You know, right now there's Merrily We Roll Along that's, that's off Broadway with Daniel Radcliffe and you have Sweeney Todd coming with Josh Groban. You have Into the Woods with that all-star cast. 
And so we keep talking about all these shows that he wrote the music and lyrics for, and I think the lyrics are left out a lot of times, and this reminded me just how smart of a writer he was. Amazing lyrics, uh, you know, and you know, the, he he wanted to write the music and the lyrics, mm -hmm. and Ethel Merman would not allow it. He was a, he was young, he was unproved, and so she got Julie Stein to do the music uh, because he'd you know been around forever. Yeah. But it was a it was a pretty amazing marriage, I thought. Yeah. Her previous musical had been a flop, and so she didn't want to trust someone who was new doing the music. Yeah. So that's why Bernstein and a few sort of big people had turned it down, I believe. I think it was this that Sondheim was writing that Catherine Hepburn traipsed next door in the middle of the night and bare feet banging on his door telling him to shut up. I didn't hear that. I haven't heard that. Well, Sondheim was quoted as saying that he thinks she just wanted to suffer for her art and... Yes, that sounds very much like Catherine Hepburn yeah. from what we've all heard about her over the years. I think it was this one. It was very much an early show in his career, and I'm pretty certain it was this that he was writing when that happened. Now, I absolutely love this. I've grown up watching it since I was very young, and ever since I was young, I've always seen it as a comedy. And it wasn't until, like, last year, a year and a half ago, a guest came on and said, well, it's more of a tragedy. And I'm like, yeah, I guess you're kind of right. And I think the reason why I see it as a comedy is because I did start off watching it when I was very young. So there was a lot of like the silliness with, you know, the, the moo cow and all that. And the strippers, obviously, and, and Rose is very over the top and, and all that. And then the Bette Midler movie came out. And I was I think it was about eight when I first saw that when that, well, that first came out. It was, it was 93. 93. But again, it was, you know, it was Bette Midler from Beaches and, and Hocus Pocus. So I was laughing my head off. I didn't see the track tragedy behind it i knew that they were real people because gypsy rose lee is obviously a name that's in the pop culture zeitgeist well yeah i mean june havoc ended up being an actor yeah. too so june also wrote a memoir and then there was a movie called they shoot horses don't they that's kind of based on on her version of of that story yep but yeah, I mean, and also when you hear everything's coming up roses, it sounds like an anthem to positivity. But in context of the show, it's Mama Rose kind of having a psychotic breakdown. Yeah. Which is which is what's so I mean, the darkness and the humor is all kind of interlinked, which is that's my jam entirely. I love that. Oh, yeah. And, and totally mine, too. And but I just didn't see it for so long. And I don't know why. I think it was that thing with these five, five flans, uh, flans, I always say Brown coats are able to watch all 14 episodes of Firefly and laugh every episode because yeah. they've they find the nuances in the character. Sure. That's what they're finding funny more so than the witty dialogue after a certain point where jokes become stale or they just don't become funny anymore. But you find different things to find funny. And I think that's what it is that people are finding different things in the characters in Firefly to find funny. That's kind of what I've done over the years is and, and in different interpretations of it as well. Having the two movies for so long and then the third one, I would find nuances in the characters and find them funny in the the portrayals of it so i for so long it just it was a comedy to, it was a musical comedy to me and i i didn't it, see it is. anything I mean, else it, yeah it's all those things but yeah there's there's some darkness there it and, is very and finally she you know yeah. she her daughter is going to be a star no matter what get up there and start taking off your clothes it's pretty great yeah it is and then these tragic strippers shout out to the beautiful Alison Frazier who has been on our show twice now and she was on the album that we did Tessie Tura yeah she was the 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 last one the, yeah the f finesse one um not the trumpeter and not the electric one yes right so, sort of the main one yeah 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 the, the main one because obviously she's Alison freaking Frazier she's a two-time Tony nominee she would want to be the main stripper <laughs> or I would complain for one thing what I think is interesting about so many of these shows that are I'd say older yeah and have been revived a bunch of times you know this show was revived on Broadway four times yep is when it was on Broadway originally, it didn't win a single Tony. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And I'm looking now because I was like, that can't be right. And so I was looking at Wikipedia. Yeah. They didn't win a single Tony. They were nominated for every single category that they were eligible for and didn't win wow. a single Tony. They were uh, swept by The Sound of Music and Fiorello swept the Tony. Wow. That Fiorello. Used. That's incredible. Yeah. Huh. And they the, those two shows tied for Best Musical. Yep. Which I didn't know was possible. Didn't you? 
in our recent Puzzle Hub podcast episode, we did Sondheim and there was a Mama Rose anagrams. Now, if I remember three actresses won Best Actress for playing Mama Rose, I think it is Patti LuPone, Angela Lansbury and Tyne Daly. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because it, it wasn't Bernadette Peters. That was a, a shame, that 2003 revival. It didn't really do well. You have Sam Mendes directing. You've got Bernadette Peters playing Mama Rose, and yet it just didn't didn't do well. And then it ends up getting revived only six years later with Ms. Patty. Well, and that's what I was saying to you before. You know, I'm a big, like, statistics, grosses, uh, yes. finance guy on on Broadway, I think it's just really interesting. Yeah. And not a single revival of this show recouped their cost. Oh, really? Huh. That's so fascinating. I mean, some of them recouped on tour after the fact, but well on Broadway, not a single show recouped. Hmm. I've said this before on the show. I want NBC to do Gypsy Live with Queen Latifah playing Mama Rose. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. Yes, I know. Yeah, I love that idea. Yes, I've put it out in the universe about 10 times already, Tim. It's going to bloody happen one day, I tell you that. I'm begging for it. Um, yes. That's a, that is a, that's a fantastic idea. Thank you very much. I, um, this says that they're still remaking the movie. Yes, Amy Sherman Palladino is meant to be directing it. Who did um Mrs. Maisel and yeah um Bunheads? Gilmore Girls. Gilmore Girls. That's the one that's more popular than Bunheads. But Bunheads was the one that I watched. Anyways, were you surprised that it was about strippers? No, I mean a lot of musicals from that era are. I mean, let's be honest. That there were really, really only two two subjects at that time. It was strippers and alcohol. Well, gambling. Or gambling. I, I put alcohol and gambling in the same stripping or vices. Yeah, it's, it is very much like one of the great American musicals. So it is a surprise that it hasn't done the best in the revivals and to make their money back because it's not only just a brilliant musical, but it is so beloved. So I don't get that. You know, we... We see in a lot of these revivals, you know, high profile stars, as we've seen with every revival of Gypsy, as with like, for example, Music Man right now, um, you see these high profile stars and yeah. producers tend to think, well, this person will sell tickets. But at the end of the day, um, as we saw, and in my opinion, obviously, everything I'm stating is my opinion, um, yeah. we saw with like Funny Girl right now is at the end of the day, the show itself, the bones still aren't amazing. And I think with Gypsy, that might also be the issue, is that the book might not be the strongest. You know, it, back in the day, they didn't need the strongest plot book in the world, whereas now that's something that we focus on a lot more. But Gypsy's book is hella strong. Like it's. I mean, it's definitely one of the stronger ones. Yeah, I think anyways. But, but in that time, it was all about the music as it is now, but now it is as much about the story as it is the music in, in most shows. Well, that, that's just what I thought was, was interesting about Gypsy was just that I found, and I, again, I, I see a lot more theater than the average person. Yeah. And I think with Gypsy, as I saw with Funny Girl, is that I got lost in the music. And at the end of the day, the story wasn't really there for me. For Gypsy? Yeah, that's how I felt. What? That's a heartbreaking story, as I found out last year. <laughs> I didn't know it to begin with. I thought it was, well, I knew that was... You know, they'd had their fight and all that. Like, I understood what was happening, but I didn't necessarily... Like, a lot of comedies or a lot of shows or even an action movie will have dramatic scenes or, you know, people will split up and stuff like that. So I didn't really see that as the anchor of the story. I just saw it as another musical comedy. But that's me. I'm a moron. Well, that's a surprise because it's a true story, obviously. Um, and what a shame we never got a recording of June Havoc playing Rose. Yeah. I like your idea still. Queen Latifah? Oh, fucking nice. Anyways. All right. Looks like Rose is wreaking havoc. So we better go to an ad break. We'll be back after this. G'day, listeners. Aaron here. While you're topping up your coffees, did you know that you can support our show 
and go on a fantastically scary adventure at the same time, go to www.thetonistontales.com forward slash bookstore to grab your copy of The Toniston Tales, a darkly funny Aussie trilogy about a young boy who rescues injured animals in his spare time and the roller coaster ride he's taken on by a literal fish out of water. Written by me, the village idiot of Thrash and Treasure, you'll come to love Toniston Turnbull and the dozens of wacky characters that he meets along the way. And here is a sneak peek. After barely three hours of light sleep, Toniston Turnbull slowly opens his eyes, his body feeling heavier than it ever has before. Not from extra weight, from tiredness and stress. Polly sighs in the shadows behind him, the flame of the nearest barbed wire tiki torch tower having died down, but not out, while Toniston napped. Are you awake? Toniston whispers. Oh, how can I sleep in this place? Polly moans, turning onto her side and facing Toniston, who stays on his back, imagining obscure animal-esque shapes in the rusted tin roof above them, shadows faintly formed by the nearest dying torches. We need to work out a way to get out of here, Toniston states the obvious. He whispers, despite the fact the nearest shacks to their own are several metres away, and the occupants presumably asleep as most prisoners seem to be. How? There's no fence to squeeze through, or even climb, Polly replies, sitting up in bed and then stretching out her sore arms. The hairs stand on end from the slight chill in the air. I don't know, but I think the whole fighting thing is a distraction. You mean to distract the other prisoners when new ones arrive? No, I, I think that was just bad timing. Didn't you notice? Toniston goes on to explain his theory. That fight happened. Everybody gathered around. I didn't see one person who wasn't watching. And then when I vomited, the only gate in this place closed shut. What are you trying to say? I think something happened when everyone's back was turned. Like what? Whispers Polly, her voice breaking up in fear. I don't know. That's what we've got to find out. Toniston's brain starts working overtime, but it's strange that nobody seems to want to leave. They seem almost happy. Definitely content. So, when's the next one of those stupid beatdowns? Toniston can't help but think Polly looks tough, almost evil in the shadows as she asks, I don't know, Toniston begins. But both teenagers are distracted by a crumbling noise in the distance, hopping out of bed, Toniston joins Polly on her own, equally uncomfortable one. Spotting a large, white package hovering close to the cave ceiling, behind it, a shadowy figure. The package is lowered down, causing the teenagers themselves to lower as well, hoping not to be spotted by whom, or what, may be operating this obscure crane. Over a long, slow descent, the package is dropped to the ground. Polly keeps her eyes on it, but Toniston looks up immediately, spotting a large black shadow scurry away to God only knows where. Come, he whispers, as he quietly hops off her bed, slipping into his docks with bare feet. Polly follows his lead. Careful to keep watch on all directions, the teenagers swiftly sneak over to the white package, their hearts beating an almost tribal jam in perfect harmony, and stopping in their tracks as the sudden realisation of what lies before them sinks in. A woman, seemingly in her early twenties, wrapped up in bandages from the neck down. No, not bandages. Is that spider web? Polly asks, completely mortified at the prospect. Grab your copy of The Toniston Tales from thetonistontales.com forward slash bookstore today. Hooroo! You're listening to Thrash and Treasure. I'm Aaron, that's Spencer, and stuck in our torture chamber is the legendary Tim Minear. And stuck was because he kept doing themed episodes on 911. So, like, one week it's like yep. everyone's stuck in something, and yep. then it's like everyone's awful. I'm like, that is so camp. It's so, it's kind of a fun show. I don't, I'm notorious for not watching procedurals. Me too. Yeah. I grew up on your work, Tim, Buffy and Angel and shows like that, that had their procedural element, but they were beyond that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I, I don't, I don't approach breaking 911 or Lone Star any differently than I broke an episode of Firefly or Angel. Yeah. In fact, I, I feel like I've been doing Firefly with fire trucks yeah. instead of a spaceship. You know? Yeah. It's quite fun. Now I do have one complaint though, that rec room, the beams are so low that is a fire hazard it is so hard to it is so hard to walk around on that part of the 
location because it's a location it's not even on a sound stage oh really i was gonna ask that it, yeah yeah it didn't yeah. look like a studio it's like a uh, a warehouse that we rent and then we yeah. just built the fire station in there we've done that for both shows yeah um but yeah those beams in the upper tier are dangerous to the cranium yeah every time the actors are ducking their heads and i sort of sitting there watching it and i'm like you guys this is a, you would have to find yourself for it like this is a fire hazard it's not good for sure that's my only complaint that and because obviously it's television that all the same characters are always going to be at the same crime scenes and stuff like that and i thought that's yeah yeah that's network television for you we make a joke that the 118 covers uh every inch of los angeles like yeah if, if, if there's a tsunami they'll be at the beach if there's a problem in the mountains that's <laughs> they'll be i'm quite enjoying it. and i love having jennifer love hewitt back on my television because it has been a while since i don't watch tv at all really i only really watch things for this show now anyways spencer you've got yeah so um you're you're making a perfect movie marathon on a saturday night what three movies are you watching and what snacks are you bringing okay well uh, i'm keto so it would have to be keto but uh, but although i will you know occasionally have popcorn uh, my three movies for the perfect evening would be Strictly Ballroom, The St the Stuntman with Peter O'Toole, and Mulholland Drive, David Lynch's Mulholland Drive. Strictly Ballroom? Wow, that's not what I was expecting at all. Like, Yeah, it's perfect. It's a perfect movie. What are you talking about? Wait, wait, well, I've seen it once. I remember Mum and I went and saw it at the movies. And it was at 92. So I was like seven years old and we just didn't get it. I remember mum didn't like it at all. And I was just, I guess, too young for it. And I've never seen it since. Oh, you should try it again. I will. You try it again. I will. It's it's not it's not a, it's, it's not a long movie. I think it's Baz Luhrmann's perfect first movie. But The Stuntman is probably my favorite movie of all time. If you haven't seen that, you need to see that. I'll put that on my list. So I'm trying to figure out what I would answer that question as. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, maybe the Toy Story 1, 2, and 3. Just give me a good trilogy something but then they, they added a fourth back to the future one two or three that's a perfect trilogy true yeah how to train your dragons i think my three would be that thing you do mm -hmm. the the tom hanks film the blues brothers okay and for for something you know uh a little a little less uh you know old comedy i'd go no i'm gonna do ferris bueller's day off those those would be my three uh, that's pretty that's pretty good that's pretty good and then but those are my three color movies though because if i were going to do i would do his girl friday i would do um, buster keaton sherlock jr it only runs like an hour and uh it's a wonderful life i know it's a cliche but i think it's a greater film than citizen kane now with the mutant enemy team am i right in saying that this was the very much the start of the writer's room as rock stars because you guys were very much we loved you guys as much as we loved what was on our screen because we knew you guys were creating it. Do you think that's where it started? You know, it probably, yes, probably on some level. I think yeah. that, that had everything to do with the, with the burgeoning internet. Yeah. Cause you know, you think about, yeah, I, I don't know how, how um, aware people were of TV writers before that era, but I, th I think a lot of it had to do with, even when I was on Lois and Clark, which was right before, you know, a couple of years before it was a mutant enemy. I interacted with fans on, you know, in AOL or uh, on like Usenet discussion boards. So I, I think the internet is what made that happen in my estimation. But yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah, I'm pretty sad because I'm trying to think of another example where multiple people in the writer's room were known to the fans on mass, not just one or two. Like, yeah, we, I, I don't know. We all know Norman Lear, but sure. But even like back in, um, you know, in the 50s, you know, Sid Caesar's staff was like Mel Brooks and Woody Allen and, you know, um, Neil Simon. <laughs> I mean, that was his writing staff. Wow. But I'm not sure that people were aware of it or even who those people were then because they had yet to have made their bones. So it's hard to say. God, all those people in the same room. How did a black hole not form and suck this whole world inside it from all that talent? Goodness gracious me. Now, Spencer, I know you got another question to ask. Yeah. What is the most out-of-body experience you've had watching someone perform on the stage? Oh, wow. Whew. Okay, this, this, this is not going to be the answer that you expect. I was probably nine, mm -hmm. and it was literally a high school. It was a high school play. 
that my or I think it was maybe even a junior high school play. My mother was a principal at a junior high school. Mm-hmm. And when I was a kid, little a little boy, uh, we went and saw probably a high school production and something about that transported me in a way that, you know, you can only be transported when you're nine. So it wasn't like it wasn't like seeing Jake Gyllenhaal doing Sunday in the Park with George, which was great. Um, it was it was just that weird experience of being a little kid and kind of starting to idolize these characters up on a stage. I don't even remember what the show was. Beautiful answer. Now, star quality, Tim, how do you define it? Yeah. When it walks in the door, what are you looking for? How, how do you define it? You know, there's an there's an old saying there was a, a chief, a, a chief justice of the Supreme Court who was asked to define pornography. <laughs> and he said, well, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Yes. <laughs> and um, I would say one of the uh, the moment there was a, there's a particular moment where I really got some star quality out of somebody. We were casting my ill fated show called Drive that mm-hmm. only went for we only made six episodes of it. And the very yeah. first character we were casting was this uh, teenage girl, Violet. And um, Emma Stone walked in to the audition and I didn't read anyone after that. She walked in the door and I'm like, that's her. Yeah. And, and in fact, John Gray, who I work with, was on the elevator with her coming up and he walked off the elevator. He's like, I just met your Violet. Um, <laughs> you know, Emma, Emma, Emma Stone had star quality coming and going. Yeah. And she's now pro- and, and, you know, I let her I let her out of an episode for a week or two so she could go make super bad. I think it was super bad. Was that was that the first movie she was in? Either that, yeah, I think it was or Easy A. No, Super Bad was beforehand. Yeah, yeah, e- e- Easy A was right after that, uh, and uh, the, my fate was sealed. Like she was going to go off and be a movie star. So I don't know. I don't know how you define it, but it's just a. It's just a. It's a. You know, they used to with Clara Bow. They called her the It Girl because you know she just had some kind of quality on screen. And so, funnily enough, Jennifer Love, you what I know, I mentioned her before. There was a scene before she turned around and i'm like there's my girl like that's that's the star that i grew up watching because yeah. she was very much that she had that she definitely has the it. camera loves her very much so and angela bassett how the hell are we not worshiping the ground that she walks on i'll never know because he is a goddess i, I do you do yes so. she's a goddess and she she is the she is the sweetest yeah. most wonderful i mean yeah her and gina torres are just like the two most wonderful people. Yeah. I, I don't know how you're not sitting there just throwing sentences at Angela Bassett, just saying, just perform this for me, just this one line. And because she just, even just if it's only two or three words. I do. It's called my job. Yeah, true. <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was thinking that, like, when I was like, why would I say that? That's like literally his job. And I ended up saying it anyways. So like, <laughs> and now, bottle episodes. Are they a fun challenge or a darn pain in the ass? Well, you know, I think people have a misunderstanding of what a bottle episode is. And I have done it on a couple shows in order to save money. Yep. Uh, you know, that's the theory, right? If you shoot, if you write something that has limited guest cast, that's all on your stages, your, you know, no locations, you know, maybe one set, you can shoot it in a day shorter on the schedule or even more. And I did one on Terriers mm-hmm. uh, that, you know, we shot that show in seven days and I think we shot it in six. And I even, sh- I even wrote a new scene while they, while we were shooting and just handed it to the actors. Yeah. And we, it was still, it was still a bottle show on Firefly out of gas is a bottle episode. Right. And I, I, I find that when I'm sort of forced to do something like that, it, it usually ends up being better. Yeah. Cause there's a the challenge is there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'd say I would say it as that. Cause I, I know I, I sort of read a lot, you know, writers and all that stuff and the whole thing about the show Bible and, and stuff like that and how it gets thrown away. But I kind of like having that, those boundaries to work within. I think that creates more of a challenge to yeah. stick to the rules that you set. And if those rules are even smaller, like you've got one or two rooms to work with that, you need to make something compelling out of that. That's a challenge. Yeah. So. I mean, that's, that's sort of the one of the ways I got to kind of, there's like three timelines in, in Out of Gas. So it's like, how do I make, you know, 44 minutes of this episode interesting in these, you know, few rooms? Well, how about if I'm telling three stories in the same rooms and I'm just shifting between the time frames? So that's necessity is the mother of invention. Mm-hmm. And sometimes and sometimes the motherfucker of invention. Yeah, true. Now, we do notice that you get a lot of, or well, a lot of our guests get a lot of repeated questions. Do you get sick of being asked about Firefly's non-future? Does it get frustrating having to repeatedly say to them? 
I don't know. Or nothing's been said. No, 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 no. If somebody's interested in something that I had a hand in, yeah, uh, I don't find I don't find that boring. I find that um, lovely. Yeah. So no, I get sick of people hammering me about particular relationships that they want on my shows. Yeah. Like, why can't you put that person with that person? And you know, you 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 know, people get mad about stuff like that. That well, gets wearying. I will say there is a certain hottie fireman that you can set up with me. Anyways, we're going to move on. Now, are, are there any more 911 spinoffs in the future? And if you plead the fifth, we will know that it's a yes. Oh, I'm going to have to plead the fifth on that. Where Where are we going? Where are we headed? I'm not I'm not saying that there's, there is a spinoff. I'm not saying that. No, you're not? Okay. No, I'm pleading the fifth. Okay. Uh, do you need an ingenue to mentor? And can I volunteer? Oh, wrong interview. Moving on. Now, <laughs> this is one thing I I find fascinating. This is American TV or censorship. American Horror Story, especially the past few seasons, has lots of F-bombs in it. Lots of swearing. Mm -hmm. It's always been very mm -hmm. graphic and very gory. Yeah. Lots of drugs and censored sex, which I like to call Christian sex. So why is it okay for you guys to show me someone being sliced in half, but not some boobies or a doodle? What? I don't get it. I think we probably could get away with some of that on Horror Story. I think we were the first. I'm not necessarily proud of this. It's sort of degrading of the culture. I think we were the first <laughs> ones to, dro to drop an F-bomb on FX. But you know, it's not broadcast TV, right? It's yeah, it's cable. It's cable. Uh, yeah. So, so we can get away with that sort of thing. Here's what I would say, and I, we have, I think, had some flashes of nudity. Not really. What I would say is that I think sex on a TV show is kind of boring. The actual act of it. Yeah. Right. If you want to see sex, you go. You look at porn. Right. It's not that interesting. Nobody wants to see actors like pretending to hump. It's not interesting. I'm not saying I want to. Okay. Right. No. I, but I'm saying that the, yeah. it's not just censorship. It's not like it's okay to cut off a breast, but you can't show one. I understand that line, uh, that line of argument. But on the other hand, I would say that gore and violence is fun to watch. Fake sex is not. I know that this is probably the most controversial thing I will say on your show. I mean, it, it's funny because I was just talking to somebody who um, recently made a pilot. And you know they have these they have these focus groups. They come in and view your pilot, and they have those dials. Yep. They dial up the interest. They dial down the interest. And every time the characters started to get physically and romantically intimate with one another, the interest rate would go down. It makes people uncomfortable when they're watching their TV shows. I guess to see that. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm that. I mean, I know that that's a very broad characterization that's not every viewer it's just as a rule people want the story to move forward and watching people fake fuck is not interesting no that's true um but it is kind of crazy on american horror story now how many gallons of guest star blood is on your hands tim oh my god that's <laughs> like 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 you could you could probably fill the strategic petroleum reserve with all the blood that's on my hands yes from the very very start a lot of death, a lot of blood, especially on 911. I was quite surprised, actually. There was one um, poor Andy Buckley getting chopped in half, and then you see his legs and all his intestines. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. this network TV, like America's, because mm -hmm. once upon a time, they couldn't even show blood. It was a no no to show blood because people would be squeamish. And now yeah. you can, and there's intestines. <laughs> We want to push things a little bit on yeah. both the nine one ones. The show is pushed over mm -hmm. the last, I'd say, three or four years. The world around me has become more pushed than my shows, so yep. it's been a little difficult to keep up. But you know, like, the, yeah, they let me show him cut in half and his intestines. However, I had a, also an episode where there was kind of this racist um, guy protesting at a military funeral, and he starts vomiting up his, his he's vomiting up his colostomy bag. They yes. would not let me show any like brown liquid. Like I couldn't show that. Thankfully. Thank you. What are you talking about? I was eating a meat pie and chips. I was smart enough not to do pasta this time, but I still need a meat pie and chips, which is gravy and meat. I, I mean, to, to me, to me, when one of my writers pitched that he started, he, he found an actual case where somebody's colostomy bag had backed up and they literally started vomiting their own waste. Yeah. I, to me, that just, I was that I was so happy. Yeah, I was like, that is the that's the greatest thing I've ever heard of. I can't wait to put that on TV. Yeah, 
Awesome. Yeah, like as I say, it's it's pretty. I thought I find it kind of camp. I don't mean that in a in insulting like no it's, bad way. I fun and camp. Some of it's camp. Some of it some of it's camp for sure. And what I would you know what's great about nine one one is that you can do a little procedural story that takes two acts. Then you can do there's a shark on the freeway, and then somebody's yep. face falls off at the yep. plastic surgeon. So it's it goes from you know ridiculous to you know, sometimes very heartfelt, but, and then also it's like big adventure. Like I did a tsunami on television. Yeah. This second season. What? The building. What? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, the, the earthquake that we did in season two, yeah. Ryan was very worried when I said I wanted to do an earthquake because he thought we were just going to shake the camera and drop some debris in front of the lens. I'm like, no, it's not CB. <laughs> it's not, it's not CBS. And so we built the hotel suite. Yeah. We built it on a giant gimbal and the entire set did this. And the actors slit like they were, it was actual gravity. Yeah, which is why all that was so good. It was like the it was a throwback <laughs> to kind of those Ir, those Irwin Allen, you know, the the Poseidon adventure. Yeah, and, I was going to say uh, the Towering Inferno. Towering Inferno and, yeah. yeah, that was fun that episode. And I thought, like, this is straight out the bat on season two. You've gone all out there, and I'm waiting for a couple of bottle episodes in the the following few episodes that'll make up the budget there. Now, um, I've got one last question. So I don't know if Spence has anything else, but if you were to compile an Avengers team using American horror story characters, which six would be saving or destroying us all? Ooh, interesting question. Well, uh, I would say, uh, you know, Fiona, yeah, good from Coven, uh, probably her daughter as well. Um, and uh, is there a good? Oh, uh, pro... you know, one of my favorite Evan Peters characters was um, uh, the crazy guy with the Mid Atlantic accent who owned the um, hotel. I their names are starting to escape. The characters' names are starting to escape me because there's been so many of them. I'm um, think not not um, Valentino. That was um. It was that season. Yeah, it was that season. I I watched a whole like thirty nine minute timeline thing just to, to catch up on the past twelve years of seasons, but it all just went through one ear and out the other. Yeah, I'm. I mean, any anybody with kind of supernatural powers, you know, pro you probably need to get like Twisty the Clown in there because that would be fun. Yep. Have him there as kind of like one of the evil Avengers. Mm -hmm. uh, or you or what you could do is you could just take all of Jessica Lang's characters and make them a like a, a boss girl team of uh, badasses. Correct answer. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. That's I would definitely what and especially going against a team of Angela Bassett's characters. Ooh, that would be formidable. Oh shit, we just destroyed the world. Anyways, uh, Spencer, do you have any more questions? If you could see one musical revived on broadway what would it be and who would star in it you know funnily enough i i would take the merrily we roll along that's happening right now lucky for you it's happening i know but i'm uh, un unlucky for me i'm in california and unlucky for me i couldn't get a ticket really unlucky for me i'm in australia kids <laughs> but i did apply for Daniel Radcliffe to come on this show and he should totally come on this show because he would love it because we're talking about music and I know he loves music because he talks about music all the time. Anyways, you have been an amazing guest. Absolutely such a thrill to have you on and thank you so much for pushing me to post those crosswords because it exploded. We got good thousands and hundreds of thousands of viewers on the website and yeah, so and I got in Buffy. Excellent. Somehow, but anyways, where can people find you on the social media? Facebook. Yep. I, I left I left the Twitters because people are just too awful. Yes, I know. But um, that's why I stay at I, I said to someone the other day that I'm staying because someone needs to play the fiddle while this burns down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Might as well be me. Exactly. So that's right. You used to be cancelled again, didn't you? That's why I'd called you the king of cancelled culture in your introduction. Yeah, no, I got it. Yeah. That was genius. Thank you very much. Um, especially like the times we live in now. But Adam says he loves you. I love him too. He said, tell Tim I love him. And I'm like, yes, I will definitely pass on that man love. I love him too. If you talk to him, tell him I said, tell him I said so. Anyways, well, that's it from us. You take care and we shall see you next time. Who wrote? Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. No worries. Have fun. Thanks so much. Okay, bye. Let's do that again.
I'm going to have to um, pick up all these papers because I throw them. It's like cue cards. I, I'm David Letterman throwing them over my shoulder. <laughs> I'm, oh, my God, fathers. And I have to do it. Like, you're one of our most illustrious guests so far, Tim, and that's saying something. It really, really is. Why did I have to do that now? <laughs> Why this time? Last time it was David Yazbek, and I left one sheet of paper across the room. And then the other sheet of paper, I was looking for it for ages. And I'm like, I'm so sorry, David. I like, you've got Grammys and all this stuff. And you're, you're like sitting here looking at me being an idiot. It was written on the back of the paper, Tim. <laughs> there is a reason why I call myself a moron. Let's just say that. I do stupid things all the time. So let's see if I can nail that introduction again. Aaron, I have to say that was probably one of my favorites. Oh my god, fathers. They take a lot out of a person too. They're not easy to do. They're really not. Well, you, you'll take you'll take a big breath and I won't even give you my response until you do it for real. Oh no, please do. Please react all the way through cuz I I freak out if if I hear silence, I'm like, "Oh my god, they hate it." Oh my god. Oh, I, I was I, I was I was being silent so I could take it all in i mean i i think i'm the only person who's going to get any of those refer- i mean half of those references Possibly, i can't believe yeah. all those references yeah. yeah i'll tell you what it's 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 fun i get to do these introductions for the world's greatest artists what a privilege it really is but then to <laughs> not record anyways i'm recording now we're gonna go again we're gonna pretend like that we're, we're gonna pretend like it never happened <laughs> oh no i'm gonna put it in there i'll be like this bit of dialogue where, that's telling us that I didn't record. That will be at the end, so the audience is going to find out. I am legitimately an idiot. I really am. It's not a. It's not a gag. It's not self-deprecating humor. It is <laughs> definitely just me. Even though I can be so smart sometimes. Anyways, we're going to take that again. I need more coffee. Probably had too much. No, you need it for those intros. Oh, tell me about it. But yes. Anyways, again, sorry to waste your time. No, no, no. Start again. Yep. In five. Four, three.